is the uh, video lecture that goes along with chapter five on cognitive development in infancy. And so in this chapter, we're gonna spend a lot of time uh, thinking about and talking about uh, Piaget's theory of cognitive development. Um, you probably remember from chapter one or from your previous experience with psychology courses um, that Piaget had four stages, sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. Um, so in the sensory motor stage, it's a lot of just what it sounds like. Um, children are sensing things and exploring their environment um, using their hands, using their mouth, using anything. Uh, you know somebody is in the sensory motor stage if they are sucking on you know, anything that, that they can get their hands on. And so um, that can be one way of knowing what stage a child is in, how are they exploring their environment. Um, Piaget was very interested in the mistakes that children made and what that told us about how they were thinking. And so he considered children little scientists and they would explore things, they would taste something and if it didn't taste good, they wouldn't eat that thing again. Um, they're just constantly trying to get more information in any way that they can. They don't have language yet and so they can't ask you questions, they can't tell you what they're feeling. Um, they can cry, which tells you something is not perfect. Um, but they don't have a lot of ways of communicating um, or, or asking questions or eliciting information. Um, and so they do what they can and you know sometimes a cry will bring somebody closer to them. And so if what they wanted was for you to come closer, well then they've achieved their goal without using uh, what we would consider language. Um, uh, language develops during this period and we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, but first I wanna talk about the difference between assimilation and accommodation. Um, assimilation is when you assimilate more detail into an existing schema that you have. Accommodation is when the new information that you have um, diverges so directly from what you already knew that you actually need a new schema for that thing. So a schema is an internal working model um, of your idea about how something works. And children are building these schemas early in life. Um, as an adult, you probably have a schema. If somebody invites you to a birthday party, um, and you stop to think, well, what do I think will happen at the birthday party? The birthday party is at four in the afternoon and there are 20 people coming. So you have a birthday party schema and you have, you know, you might not know exactly what's gonna happen, um, but you've been to enough birthday parties that you would have some idea of what would happen. If you go to that birthday party, in addition to the regular things like perhaps having a cake and singing and saying happy birthday to the person and there might be some gifts, um, in addition to all of those things, if there's also um, a clown or a bouncy house or, or those kinds of things, you can assimilate that into your existing schema for birthday parties. On the other hand, if you knock on the door and they open the door and it's like, great, we're glad you're here. We just had a load of rocks delivered and everybody is gonna work for a couple of hours with wheelbarrows and shovels, um, helping us move this pile of rocks to our backyard. And then after that's over, we're gonna have a barbecue. Um, you would need a new birthday party schema to accommodate for that thing. First of all, you might just say, that's not a birthday party and I'm not staying. Um, but if that's part of a birthday party tradition, you need a new schema for birthday parties that aren't necessarily fun or that involve a lot of work that you hadn't signed up for. Um, so the difference between assimilation and accommodation can kind of be a blurry line. Sometimes you need a new schema and sometimes you're just adding to an existing schema um, if it's, um, you know, I'll try, if I ever ask you about that on a test, um, I'll try and make it abundantly clear that it's one or the other. But, um, you know, it's just your way of building or the infant's way of building their own internal working models of, of how the world works. Um, uh, in your, um, you know, another example of that, um, recently I drove a car for the first time. I drove somebody, <laughs> I didn't drive for the first time. I drove somebody else's car for the first time and I, all I needed to do was move the car to a legal parking spot. And I got into it and I couldn't figure out how to turn it into reverse. It's a brand new car um, and instead of having a shifter um, stick that you would move or something that you would move to reverse and neutral and drive, um, there was a button for drive. And there was also one that said R, but when you pushed on it, nothing happened. And I was like, mm, I'm pretty sure I can get out of this parking spot, but I'm also pretty sure I shouldn't drive a car that I couldn't put into reverse if I needed to, if I got into another situation. Um, and I sat there for long enough and finally figured out that you had to hook your finger underneath and there was a button that you couldn't see that was behind there. And when you pushed on that or when you pulled back on that, the car would reverse. Well, it makes a lot of sense if that's how you learn, but um, to me, like I needed an entirely new schema about 
how you navigate cars. Um, I couldn't assimilate that into my existing schema of, you know, sometimes the shifter is here and sometimes the shifter is here. I needed a new schema for when there's no shifter. So that's just another example. Um, this chapter also talks about language development. And remember in the last chapter, um, I asked you to look at motor development and say, you know, if, the, if you found a child, hopefully you haven't found any babies, um, and they could sit up but not walk and so on, that you would be able to estimate how old the child was. Similarly with language development, um, if the child doesn't have any words yet, they're probably under a year old, um, you know, just roughly. Um, if they can say some words but they can't use two word sentences, then they're probably somewhere between a year and two years. Um, and then after two years, there are two word sentences and, and so on. Um, your book talks about different aspects of language development. Um, and in particular, I think it's important to know um, phonology and morphology. Phonology are units of sound. And, and this will come up in your assignment this week. A, unit, a morpheme is the smallest unit of sound in any given language. So when you were born, you were exposed to the sounds in the language that was around you. And that enabled you to continue to be able to differentiate those sounds as an adult. Um, if you were not exposed to the morphemes of a language that you're trying to learn, or the phonemes, excuse me, of a language you're trying to learn, it will be hard for you to distinguish those sounds. So that's where you need that experience. It's experience dependent um, in order to be able to distinguish those phonemes and distinguish units of sound. That's why um, you may speak a second language um, and you may speak it with an accent. You may not, but if you speak it with an accent, the accent may not be perceptible to you because you're not hearing those distinctions, um, but it would be perceptible to somebody who's a native speaker of that language. Morphemes and morphology. Morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning. Um, and so, you know, we can count how complex a child's speech is by counting units of meaning within, within their speech. Um, an example of a unit of meaning would be, um, uh, so a, a very small word has one unit of meaning and one morpheme, um, paper. Paper has one unit, uh, one morpheme. But um, if you said something like um, going, going has two units of meaning. Um, it's the verb to go, but you're also in the process of doing that thing. So I'm not gonna ask you to do sentence diagramming for either phonemes or morphemes, um, but just be aware that those are ways that we can assess a child's language, their facility with language, um, and the complexity of the language that they're learning. Um, uh, another um, two things to know about uh, language is um, children use holophrases and telegraphic speech. A holophrase is when a child's about a year old and they're learning words, they start to want to communicate an idea, um, but they don't have full sentences, they don't have enough vocabulary yet, and they will use one word to uh, express an entire uh, idea or, or phrase. Um, so they might say park, meaning I would like to go to the park today. Um, so, but they just say park, that's a hollow phrase because it's just one word. At about two years of age, they start to use what we call telegraphic speech, which leaves out all of the extraneous words and just uses the minimum number of words. Um, it's as if you were um, text messaging with somebody and you had to pay for every word, then you wouldn't use entire sentences. You would just use the words that were absolutely necessary. Telegraphic speech is what children use when they, again, don't have um, enough experience with language. They don't have enough um, vocabulary. And so they'll say, go store, meaning I want to go to the store. So holophrase, one word, telegraphic speech, um, usually two words or, or just a couple of words to convey an entire meaning. Um, I think that's it for the highlights for chapter five. There's a lot in chapter five. I hope you enjoy it. Who knows what's expected. So have a good week and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye.